Hello, everybody. I'll be waiting for a minute. How's everybody doing? Welcome to my office. Hope you're having a good day. It is 7.02. Um, today is May 4th. And I want to invite you to our Mother's Day service this Sunday at 12 o'clock. We're going to have a Mother's Day service to recognize all the grandmothers out there, all the moms out there. We want to just uh, make that day very special. How's it going? Welcome. Today I'm going to be talking about the four horsemen of Revelation. Yes, it's in the Bible. I'm taking um, uh, my church right now through the book of Revelation. And I'm learning a lot by going through the book of Revelation. When I read the book of Revelation, uh, my eyes are open uh, to what's going to happen in the near future. But before we get into the the word, I think it's important to start in prayer. So if you could bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray for you and those that are going to be joining uh, joining us soon and those that are watching on, on YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Here we go. Father God, I just trust you, Jesus. You say if two or three gather together in your name, you are there in the midst. We invite you uh, to be a part of this Bible study. Jesus, you know more than me. You know more than all of us combined. Uh, help us to understand what's going to happen in the near future. Uh, Jesus, you say that uh, the Antichrist is going to come. And you, you talk about all kinds of things that must happen before your, your second coming. Prepare our hearts and minds for whatever is going to take place in this world. And help us not to be afraid, because if you are with us, who could be against us? We trust you and love you. Amen. Well, thank you for taking the time to join me. So we're going to go into uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I'm going to read 1 through 2. It's a recap on what happened on Sunday if you were with us on Sunday, uh, I talked about the, the coming of the Antichrist. So we read in Revelation 6, 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened up one of the seals. I got a little visual for you. I don't think it's going to look like this, but I made this. So these seven seals represents the judgments of God. And so Jesus opens up the first seal. And this is what happens when he opens up the first seal. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a, a voice like thunder. Ooh, that must have been scary. How many guys get scared when you hear thunder at night? So here John hears a voice from heaven that sounds like thunder. And this voice says, come and see. So is this voice speaking to John? I don't think so. This voice that sounds like thunder is actually speaking to this white horse. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow. A crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So, here's another demonstration. So this guy on the white horse has a crown. You might think it's Jesus, but it's not. It's a substitute. It's a wannabe Jesus. It's the Antichrist. Because in Revelation chapter 19, we read that Jesus has 
many crowns, not just one crown. So this imposter, this antichrist is coming and he's going to ha have a white horse. He's going to promise peace. But really, his mind is bent on war, on conquest. He wants to kill, steal, and destroy. This is the devil's son. We call him the Antichrist. And so I'm going to ask a few questions. And so I asked my brother this question today. Are the four horsemen, are they here today? We just read about the first horseman, the Antichrist on the white horse. And my brother looked me, well actually I was talking to him on the phone, but if I was talking to him, he would have looked me in the eyes and said, yes, I believe the four horsemen are here. He says, the four horsemen are here, Jose. It's me, Danny, Phil, and Andy. <laughs> My brother says that he's one of the four horsemen. <laughs> My brother cracks me up. Uh, so the first horseman is going to promise peace. But really, he's coming to bring war and conquest. Maybe the Antichrist is going to bring peace for a short season to get control of the world. We read in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, While the people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on, the, on them suddenly. So the world is like, oh, this is a peaceful time. Things are going great with the new president, with the new world leader. Things are gravy. Oh, I love him. And the next thing you know it, destruction comes. Paul says, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. So we're not going to be able to escape this. Like it or not, this antichrist, this person on the white horse, this wannabe Jesus is going to try to take complete control of the Middle East. But is he going to stop there? No, he's going to go to the West. And he's going to, he wants dominion. He, he has a, a God complex. He wants to be like God. He wants to have control. He's all, the Antichrist, the devil, has always wanted to have control. But we know that God has ultimate control. What's up, John? How you doing? We know the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. The Bible says He is the God of gods. So when things aren't going right in your life, I know things aren't always going right in my life, I trust in God because He's in ultimate control. So when it looks like the world is, is pretty chaotic, just know God is still sitting on his holy throne. So the Antichrist is bent for war and conquest. The Bible says he has a bow. But what's interesting is in Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, there's no arrow. So this Antichrist has so much clout. He doesn't even have to pull out the arrow. People are so afraid of him. They listen to everything he says. It's kind of like a police officer. He doesn't have to show you his bullets to know that there's bullets inside that gun. So the Antichrist, he has all this power and he doesn't even have to pull out the gun. He doesn't have to pull out the bullets. Everybody is obeying him because they're so afraid of him. They don't want to die, so they're obeying him. Kind of like when Hitler took over much of Germany or took over all of Germany and much of Europe. Hitler didn't have to pull out his gun every day. They knew he had the power. They knew he had control. So this Antichrist, he's bent on war. He's bent on conquest. He's bent on having total power of the whole world. So let me ask you a serious question. What is your bent? What, what is your bent? Where is your mentality? Like, wh what do you think about all the time? See, this anti 
uh, Christ, he has a mental bent. He's just thinking about war and conquest and taking control of this planet. What's your bent? Hopefully you have a bent towards peace. You, you have a bent towards loving people, towards giving people grace. We all need it. Growing up, I had a bent towards hip hop music and break dancing. That was my bent. Like when I heard, I heard a good song, I heard the beat, you know, I was going to start dancing. I, I still, I, when I still hear good music, I, I still feel like dancing. But I have a spiritual bent, you know. My bent is towards Jesus, is towards prayer, is towards the Word of God. My, my spiritual bent is trying to help people to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior before it's too late. Kind of like that song, Closing Time. You know, if you've ever been to a bar, I know you guys have never been to a bar or to a club. You guys are all good Christians. But they have this thing called Closing Time. And that means the bar is about to close, the club is about to close. Well, closing time, Revelation is about closing time. It's judgment day. God's saying enough is enough. It's time to judge the world. And so he, he breaks off the first seal. The first seal represents judgment upon the nations. Not just upon, not just upon America, but upon the, the nations of the world. So we read about the second horseman. It's a judgment. The second horseman, we're going to go to Revelation 6, 3, and we're going to read through 4. When we open, when he, when Jesus opened up the second seal, so Jesus opens up the second seal. I'm not Jesus. I'm, you know, it's a, what is it called? When, when you're a reenactment of what's going to happen in the future. See, Jesus opens up the second seal. And then John, he says this, I heard the second living creature saying, Come, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given him a great sword. Now, this Antichrist, has this great big sword. So some Bible scholars believe that this it's the Antichrist on each horse. Remember, we just got them reading that he's bent for war. He His mentality is destruction. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He, most of all, he wants to destroy your relationship in God. He wants to destroy your hope in Jesus. He wants to destroy the Bibles, he wants to destroy the churches. And we've seen that happen in our world. Look at what was happening in uh, not too long ago in Iraq. ISIS came and they what did they start to do? They, they started to destroy the churches throughout Iraq. And so the Antichrist is going to come and he wants to destroy the church. He wants to destroy your faith in God. He's a killer. He comes to bring war. He, so the red horse represents bloodshed. He wants to, uh, he, he wants to gain control of the world. And if he has to do it through bloodshed, so be it. And this is a prophecy. Is Zechariah chapter 1 verse 8. I looked out in the night. And I saw a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the valley. So this Antichrist, remember, he's not coming from heaven. Jesus is coming back from heaven. This Antichrist is here on planet Earth. And there's some people, I was actually talking to a friend, who believes the Antichrist is here today. I don't know. You know, it's funny, I was talking about on Sunday how uh, the Democrats, they thought uh, Trump was the Antichrist. And Republicans, they thought Obama was the Antichrist. It's so silly how, how people jump to conclusions. People thought Ronald Reagan was the anti Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming. It's, it's not Joe Biden. 
But the Antichrist is coming. And he's going to gain control, not of just the United States of America, but the world. He wants the world at his fingertips. Just like Hitler. Hitler was trying to take over Europe, but he wasn't going to stop at Europe. He was going to take over the nations. America was next. Japan. Yes, he made friends with Japan. But after he took over the U.S., he was going to take over all, all of Asia. So this Antichrist, he's, he's on a red horse, which represents bloodshed. He's a man of war. And Jesus predicted this. Matthew 24, 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. But see it, that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. Someone may argue, well, Pastor Jose, there's always been wars. Yes, that's true. But it's going to intensify in the last days. There's going to be more and more wars. There, there's been documentation that there's been more wars this past century than all the centuries combined. And look, it's only 2021. Can you calculate how many wars there, there have been in 21 years? Too many to count. So the Antichrist comes to bring war. But if you're a Christian, if you're a believer in God, we're called to bring peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So the Antichrist is coming to bring war. And, and as children of God, we're called to bring the opposite. We're called to bring peace. So here is a, a good question for you and for me. What is your biggest war or battle that you must face? Let me ask you one more time. What is the biggest war or battle that you must face? Can I be real with you? Sometimes my battle is with discouragement. I get discouraged sometimes. Sometimes people let me down. Sometimes I see the attendance, the church attendance on Sunday and it's real low. I get discouraged. I'm human. I get discouraged sometimes. I had a friend that was telling me, Jose, uh, uh, your pro he was saying it in a nice way, like, uh, your problem is that you're focusing too much on humankind. We're all going to let each other down because we're human. We, we, all, we all make mistakes. And I've made a ton of mistakes in my life. But let me tell you, there's one person that won't let you down. His name is Jesus. His name is God Almighty. We need to put our faith in him, not in people. Because people will let you down, but God will never let you down. When you go to God, you'll find encouragement. But when you focus on the wrong thing, and I think God was speaking to me this week, telling me, Jose, your problem is you're, fo you're not focusing, you're focusing on people when you need to focus on me. See, when I focus on Jesus, everything seems to be okay. But when I start focusing on the wrong things, situations, I get my problems or my challenges. Uh, sometimes I get discouraged. How about you? So let me, I was being honest with you. What's your biggest battle? I fight discouragement sometimes. What do you need to fight? We're all called to fight. Fight the good fight. John 16, we find hope and encouragement here by the words of Jesus himself. I told you these things so that you may have peace. Actually, he says, in me, you will, you will have peace. So if you want to have peace, if you're going through a difficult time right now, I'm here to tell you, you could have peace in Christ. And Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. I love the Lord, how he keeps it real. You're going to have problems. But take heart. Don't give up. I have overcome the world. And I want you to know that you're going to overcome the world too. 
I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what battle you're facing right now, but you're going to overcome it. In Jesus' name, you're going to overcome it. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to overcome depression, anxiety, discouragement. Whatever sadness that you've been dealing with lately, pain. Jesus overcame the world. And in Christ, you could overcome this world too. So now we're going to read about the third horseman. Revelation 6, 5. We read here, when he opened up the third seal. Now Jesus has opened up the third seal. And what does John see? He says, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and behold a black horse. And he who sat on it had a, a pair of scales in his right hand. And it I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not harm the oil or the wine. Okay, this definitely needs some interpretation. So, what John sees here in heaven, famine coming to planet earth. A black horse represents death. This is my boy, Josiah. Say hi to everybody. Hi. I just got back from practice. You just got uh, done with baseball practice. Did you hit good today? Yeah, I smashed the ball all the way to the outfield on the, um, the um, juniors field. He smashed the ball today to outfield all the way to the juniors. No, the juniors. No, we, were, we weren't on my field. We were on the league Two leagues ahead of me, Phil, and I hit it to the outfield. Good job. My son loves baseball, and so he just got back from baseball practice. So, back to what I'm saying. So, John has a vision of this third horse, and it's black, which represents death. It represents famine. We read in Luke 21, 11. And so, if you read... Revelations, and you read the Gospels, there's parallels. There's overlap. Jesus says, in the last days, there'll be earthquakes, famine, pestilence in various places. Luke 21, 11. What's interesting, the word pestilence can be translated to plague, pest. I mean, there's rumor, we're, we're not... We don't know for sure, but some people think COVID came from an a animal, from monkeys, or no, bats. But the rumor was AIDS came from monkeys. And then the, uh, during the Black Plague, we know that mice had, had the disease, uh, a disease or had the plague. So Jesus is saying there's going to be lots of plagues in the last days. And there's going to be famines and earthquakes. Are there famines in our world today? In the world, according to world vision, there are famines going on in our world today. In a recent report, and it's, it's not going on throughout Africa, but parts of Africa. We know Africa is composed of many different countries. Can you guys turn my light back on, please? Someone turn my light off. So Africa is composed of many different countries. And according to World Vision, they say this. Reoccurring drought, conflict, instability led by, led, has led severe sh food shortages. Many countries have struggled with extreme poverty for decades. So they lack government and community support systems to help their struggling families. In other words, according to World Vision, there are uh, food shortages. There's a food shortage, not throughout the whole continent of Africa, but parts of Africa, there's famines going on. I remember growing up, I used to watch those commercials of, of the, the black kids with the pot bellies, and they're starving to death, and, and they're asking for us to donate money 
to help feed the kids in Africa. There was a famine going on back then. And so there's still famines going on in our world. We don't, we're blessed to live in the United States. So there's no famine going on currently in the United States of America. But I would say that there's a spiritual famine. There's a famine people that are mal, uh, that malnutrition or they have a lack of spiritual food. You know, we, we have a lot of uh, physical food, bread, pizza, you name it. But the spiritual food, I think people are starving to death. How many people make time to go to a Bible study on Tuesday night or Wednesday night? How many people go to church on Sundays to hear God's word? There is a spiritual famine happening in our world today. And we read in Psalms 37, 25. I have been young and now I am old. Yet I have not, see, I have not yet seen the righteous forsaken or seen his children begging for bread. In other words, this, this psalmist is saying that God's going to take care of his children. That you don't have to worry about begging for bread. That God's going to take care of his people. You don't have to worry about a famine. Maybe a famine is going to happen in these last days, but God's still going to provide for you and for me. We don't have to worry. But it is a judgment upon this world. Just think about it. A lot of us take food for granted, don't we? A lot of us will eat without saying grace, without thanking God for the food. I mean, I'll, I was at Thanksgiving dinner not too long ago, and everybody started eating before saying thanks. But me and my family, we, we grabbed hands, and we started praying and thanking God for the food before we ate. And so God's like a... He's going to, in the last day, say, okay, it's judgment day. Don't forget who's your daddy. Don't forget I'm the provider. If it wasn't for me, there'll be no rain. If it wasn't for me, there'll be no bread. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't have money to buy food. So there is a physical famine that's happening in our world. And in the last day, it's going to be severe on another level. We read in Amos chapter 8, 11. Look, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll send a famine throughout the land. Not a famine of food or thirst for water, but rather a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. So God is the one that sends the spiritual famine, and he's the one that could cause a physical famine to happen in our world, where there's a lack of water, where there's a lack of resources, where there's a lack of cattle and plantation. So the, the black horse represents death because may, many people die when there's a famine. And we know there's a spiritual famine happening right now in the USA, in the United States of America, and not just in the United States, but in Europe and throughout most parts of the world, there is a spiritual spiritual famine happening right now. According to Ed Stetzer, in the, in the next year or two, 50% of the population in the United States, and Ed Stetzer, you could do the research. He's a researcher himself. He's been doing the research for a long time on churches, on the growth of the, the church, and he, he, he he's... He wants to measure the health of the church, not just any church, but the global church of America. And he says this, 50% of Americans in the next, less than the next, in the next 10 years, he said this a few years ago, so I'm thinking in the next two years, this is going to happen. 50% of Americans will say none when, when you ask them, what's your religious affiliation? They're going to say none. 50% of Americans, when, when you write down, what are you? You know, some people put Catholic, Jewish, Christian, Muslim. But 50% of Americans are going to put none. I don't 
affiliate. I don't affiliate with any religion. That, that's actually good news. That means 50% of the people I talk to don't know Jesus. And they need Jesus. So you and I have a great opportunity to share our faith with, with people. Because half of the people we know don't even believe in God anymore. Dr. Tony Evans says this. The Antichrist will, will take over the world's economic order. That's my son, Jaden. Water break. Let me say this again. According to Dr. Tony Evans, who's a Bible scholar, says this. The, anti the Antichrist will take over the world's economic order. So he's going to say, all right, you want food? You got to take the mark. You got to take the mark of the beast. Revelation 13, 17. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark. What is that mark? 666. Six, six. Whatever you do, don't take that mark to get some bread. Don't take that mark to get some water. It's not worth it. Because the Bible says whoever takes that mark is condemned. That person will be condemned with the Antichrist. Here's the last horse, and then we're going to close. Revelation 6, 7. The fourth horse. We read, When he opened up the fourth seal, So Jesus is opening the fourth seal, the fourth judgment upon the nations. When he opened up the fourth seal, I heard a voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come! So I looked, and behold, a, pa a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it is Death. And Hades followed him. And power was given to them over the fourth of the earth. So one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Wow. So this fourth horseman is similar to the first horseman because it's probably the same rider. He's there to kill. He's there to destroy. So the word pale here in Greek is chloros, kind of like chlorine. But it means pale green or yellowish, yellowish pale. So this horse, this pale horse is about to die. He's ready to die. It's a sick horse. It represents death as well. And following this black, or this pale horse, these four horsemen are, are almost like together. They're one. Hades is following. So there's another horse called Hades. The word Hades means the realm of the dead. The nether world, the unseen world, the grave, a.k.a. hell. So hell is following this pale horse. So let me ask you a question. We're almost done. Are you scared of the grave? Are you scared to die? See, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you don't have to worry about Hades. You don't have to worry about any of these horses. God's going to take care of you. Did you know this? That right now, there are over 7 billion people on this planet. In the next... 2021, there's 7 billion... 8,774,965,825 people on this planet. So let's round up. 
according to uh, the census, by 2023, there'll be 8 billion people on this earth. That's a lot of people. And according to this passage, one-fourth of them will die. To this, this fourth horse is going to kill roughly two billion people. A quarter of the people on this planet will die. These horses are there to judge the people of the earth. It's God's judgment upon the nations. See, there's grace and judgment go hand in hand. God is a God of grace. But he's also a God of judgment. Just, just picture in your mind, let's say uh, there was a serial killer out there. And then he gets caught. And then the judge has to make a decision if he's going to get the death penalty or if he's going to do life in prison. And the, the judge says, tells the serial killer, you know what? I'm just going to let you off the hook. Just don't do it again. Would that be justice? Of course not. See, God is a God of justice. But he's also a God of grace. So we could choose to receive his grace or to receive his, his righteous just, justice someday. We see God's grace on the cross. We see God's justice here in the book of Revelations. And right now, there's people dying of COVID. There's been over 3 million people that have died of COVID. 3.22 million people have died of COVID. And right now, it's peaking in India. Let's pray for India. So COVID's not over yet. Maybe after it's all said and done, we're, this is going to be tripled. There'll be 9 million people that have died of COVID. That's a lot of people. There's only one plague that's killed more people. That was the Black Plague. And so the Bible says that there will be plagues in the last days. There'll be pestilence. So the question is, is the pale horse here in our world today? Is Hades with her? I can't answer that question, but there's a strong possibility that the that last horse, that fourth horseman is here. But only God knows. But we don't have to be afraid. Re Romans 8, 1 says this, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So if you're in, in Christ Jesus, you don't have to worry about any of those horses. But here's the question. How many people do we know that are outside Christ? Too many to count. So death represents pestilence and plagues. Okay, I just have a couple more questions and then we're going to close. Have we, not, have we not seen one of the worst plagues ever to hit mankind since the Black Plague that killed 20 million people? The answer is yes. Are people changing because of COVID-19? The answer is no. Revelation 16, 11 says this, And they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and for their sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. So even when God releases his righteous indignation upon the world, even when God releases all these plagues, these judgments upon the world, people are so hard-headed they won't even change. They won't even say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I want to close with this dream I had the other day. And then I'm going to read a final passage. So this happened actually in February. It was one of those vivid dreams that I won't ever forget. I actually have a, a, a dream journal. I write down my dreams in this journal. And then in the journal, you can write down the interpretation of the dream. So I, I, I went to sleep, and in the middle of the night, maybe about 3 o'clock, I, I, um, I, I'm in this dream. And it, it felt, have you ever had a, vi a vivid dream, and it, it felt so real? Like, 
it was one of those dreams. I, I, I thought it was like, it was, I didn't think I was in the dream. I, I thought I was in reality. So I'm at this river. It might have been the Jordan River, but it was a beautiful river. And now I think about it, Jesus was baptizing me. So I'm going under the water and I have complete joy. I know I'm under the water and, and it's like slow motion. I'm coming out of the water and I'm so happy. I feel free. I, I got the joy of God in my heart. I, the Holy Spirit's all over me. So I, I get done getting baptized at this river. And after I get out of the water, I see a, a man and he's by the river bend. Uh, he's by the riverside. And he's, he's next to get baptized, but he has alcohol with him. And, and I was like, hey, are you gonna get baptized? It's your turn. And he's like, nah, I can't. I was like, why can't you? And he's like, because of this. He's like, he, he tells me he can't give up, he can't give up his alcohol. And so I, I wanna do him a favor, so I grab his alcohol and I dump it into the river. And then he gets really upset with me, angry, like ready to fight me. And I'm like, man, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. If you don't wanna get baptized, that's fine. We're not gonna force you to get baptized. And so I, I offer him to, to get him a drink because he's really upset with me because he didn't wanna let go of the alcohol to get baptized. And so we go to the liquor store. I, I'm getting ready to purchase the alcohol for him because he's so upset with me and he wants his alcohol back. He doesn't want God in his life. He'd rather have alcohol in his life. And so after I get done purchasing his alcohol, I'm ready to give it to him. This man turns into the devil and he's ready to attack me. But something stirs in my spirit where I'm not afraid of him. And I start rebuking the devil in the name of Jesus. And he starts backing up and he starts retreating He's scared. He starts like to almost like run away from me because I, the spirit of God's in me and I'm saying in the name of Jesus, get out of here. And I wake up. I want you to know that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. We don't have to be afraid of the antichrist. We don't have to be afraid of these four horsemen. If God is for us, who could be against us? Matter of fact, we read in Revelation 8.35, who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is what I want you to know. Who or what can separate you from the love of Christ? Answer that question. Who or what can separate you from the love of Christ? We know the answer, nobody. No situation, no demon, no horseman, no antichrist. Nothing in this world can separate you from the love of Jesus. So I'm going to pray for you. Thank you for joining. Love you, Mom. I love you guys. Father God, I just thank you for this Bible study about the four horsemen. Prepare our hearts and minds. For you're coming back soon, Jesus. But Lord, if we have to be here when all hell breaks loose on planet Earth, help us not to be afraid. You'll protect us from Hades. 
You'll protect us from the Antichrist. And even if we have to die for, for our faith, so be it. We, we are promised to go to a better place. For that, we give you glory. Amen. Remember, this Sunday is Mother's Day. Come to Hope City Church at 12 o'clock. We want to honor our grandmothers. We want to honor our mothers. I'm not going to tell you, but we're going to be doing something very special for all the mothers. So bring your mom to church this Sunday. We're at 3750 Rosin Court here in Natomas, right behind the Taco Bell off of Northgate Boulevard. Hope to see you this Sunday. Love you. Bye.